Now, in other European countries, there are also ongoing discussions about what measures to introduce and when. Some countries are focusing on the best ways to reach what's being called herd immunity, a critical point in a pandemic when the number of people who have grown immune to the virus automatically limit its spread. Now, for weeks, the British government, for example, avoided implementing restrictions on wider society. The goal appeared to be to allow members of the community who are considered less vulnerable to be infected in orders to reach the tipping point of herd immunity sooner. But after models showed how badly UK hospitals would be overwhelmed in such a scenario and the potentially hundreds of thousands of deaths it would cause, priorities have shifted. Nonetheless, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson remains hesitant about curfews. There's a, a point that I think people intuitively understand about the, the timing of, of these measures. You've got to impose these interventions in the spread of the epidemic at the moment when they can have the maximum effect. And after all, when the epidemic is, is hardly spreading at all, that's not the moment to, to impose uh, curfews and prohibitions on movement and so on and so forth. You've got to wait until, uh, alas, until uh, it's the right moment to do it. And that's always been how we've been guided. So all right, let's bring in our science correspondent, Derek Williams, for more on this. Hi, Derek. So is now the right time for Britain to be implementing these measures? Or are they coming too late? Well, I think that most experts would say Boris Johnson has gotten something very wrong here, starting with the use of the word intuitively. The thing is, epidemics like the one we're seeing don't follow intuition or hunches. They follow certain statistical projections, which is why we're able to model them mathematically. The big fallacy with his comment is that from a prevention point of view, the time to impose curfews and lockdowns is not when large numbers of people are getting the disease. It's, it's, it's before large numbers of people begin to get the disease. That's the only way to slow it down because there's an incubation period. New infections and deaths are going to continue to rise for at least two to three weeks even after strict social distancing measures have been imposed. So we'll only see the consequences of what we do today in two to three weeks. That's one of the lessons that we learned from China and Italy. If you wait until numbers shoot up to react with measures, then ultimately many more people are going to get the infection and it's going to kill a lot more of them. Derek, we mentioned this concept of herd immunity. Can you tell us more about what exactly it means and what role it plays in slowing the spread of the virus? Well, herd immunity is when so many people in a population are immune to an infection that it effectively stops the disease from spreading. There are two different ways that a person acquires immunity. Either you catch the disease and you build up an immune response that prevents you from being infected by the same bug in the future, or you're vaccinated, which fools the body into responding like it caught the disease, even though it didn't. But to reach herd immunity, it doesn't matter which of those two ways people have developed an immune response. What's important is that as the number of people who are immune to the bug rises in a population, it begins to spread more slowly. Let's say that at the beginning of an outbreak, when no one is immune, an infected person gives it to two other people. But once 50% of the population has acquired immunity, an infected person can only give it to one other person rather than two. That's because the other one would, that they would have given it to is already protected because they're immune. So rising immunity in the herd in society as a whole is, puts the brakes on the spread of the disease. So are there ways to actually control the process of reaching herd immunity? Well, most researchers I've been talking with to say it's an interesting thought experiment, but one that, you know, this idea of controlled herd immunity, but, but it's one that has a couple of very serious flaws. First, we still know very little about, about immunity to the virus or how long it lasts. We assume there's going to be an immune effect of some kind after someone gets over COVID-19, but we still don't know enough about that. It's a, it's a major risk to just allow a virus to spread when you don't know whether people could quickly get it a second time. Then there's the question of how controlled it would all remain. You know, the point behind social distancing measures is to slow the spread of the disease, to flatten the curve until you have medicines and vaccines in place. Herd immunity can also be reached with vaccines and they don't kill people. If you allow people to catch the virus, even in a controlled setting, then some of them are going to die. And it's far too easy to imagine a scenario where intentionally allowing people to catch the disease could spiral out of control and bring down the health system. 
So the message most researchers are sending is, I think, of course, we want herd immunity, but trying to get it by intentionally allowing people to get sick is going to cost lives, probably a lot of them. Until we have medications and a vaccine, as tough as they are, lockdowns and social distancing are better choices. All right, Derek, and what is the latest that you're seeing from researchers uh, in the fight against the virus? Well, there's a story on vaccines that caught my eye actually this weekend. This German biotech, CureVac, um, which we've been hearing a lot about in the news, is so confident that its approach is going to work that it announced a few days ago that it's already ramping up production of its, of its RNA vaccine candidates, even though the company is still in very, very early testing. You know, if you recall, we've been hearing from top health authorities that it'll take at least 18 months before a vaccine is really ready for widespread use. And that's because there are a lot of regulatory hoops to jump through, starting with safety issues and ending with questions about effectiveness. It just takes time. But if you're confident your product has a good chance of working, you can start making doses while testing is going on. If they don't work out, you wasted time and effort. But if you do, then you saved a lot of valuable time. Who knows? Maybe... Maybe we'll see an effective vaccine by the end of the year after all. That would be an amazing achievement. Fingers crossed for CureVac and all the other companies out there trying to make it happen. All right. That's some promising news there. Uh, Derek Williams, DW Science, thank you very much. Well, as we just heard here in Germany, pharmaceuticals, biotech companies are racing to come up with a vaccine for the virus and to think of solutions to take pressure off of the healthcare system. Now, one German company called Kiagen is producing diagnostic tests for COVID-19, and it's had to overhaul its operation in response to the crisis. Staff here at Kiagen can barely keep up with demand. The biotech company produces molecular diagnostics equipment, now including a rapid test for the novel coronavirus. Production has been ramped up here at HQ near Cologne. We've increased our output by more than 70% in a very short space of time. We're increasing production to such an extent that instead of producing 1.5 million tests per month, we'll be making 20 million per month by the end of the year. One test is needed per patient. We've introduced a three-shift-per-day system, seven days a week. The company reacted quickly to the new coronavirus outbreak. Testing equipment that's been on the market since 2018 has been upgraded and can now diagnose a person for coronavirus in just one hour. This rapid test is intended for use in hospitals and laboratories, and it was approved for use in Europe last week. This is a global challenge, and the situation varies from country to country, especially in how quickly they recognised the virus and whether or not they acted quickly. Asian countries like South Korea responded much more quickly than countries like the US. Demand is soaring all over the world, though, and so it's a global challenge to make testing facilities available everywhere. Kiagen's track record has also piqued the interest of other companies hoping to cash in. U.S. lab equipment maker Thermo Fisher is now set to buy key again for around 10 billion euros, right in the thick of the corona crisis. Shareholders have to approve the acquisition before it goes ahead.